Is there in a flight? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another um, great session. Uh, come cloud with us. Uh, my name is Abdul Kazi. I have my co-host, uh, Chris Gale. Hey, Chris. How you doing? Hey, great. And you? Good, good. Hey, looking forward to spring. It seems like North America-ish, we're getting some kind of spring weather, but you never know. There might be one more winter uh, right. snowstorm. And, uh, we're seeing this sunlight thing too here in you know Rochester, New York, which I know is unusual for this part of the year, but we'll take it. So, hey, send me some uh, sun over in Toronto too. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go that way. I'm sending it that right? way. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, so we have a great show for you today. We have uh, Purnima Nayar from the UK. So thank you so much uh, coming on the show. Uh, this is a pre-record session because of the timing uh, and she's been generous to do this over the weekend. So absolutely and uh, more graciously, thank you so much for doing that, taking time uh, out of your weekend to record this for us. So with that being said, uh, please introduce yourself at, and tell us about yourself. Hello everyone. Thank you Abdul and Chris for having me as a speaker today at Come Cloud with us. Um, I am Purnima Nair, and I am talking to you from Berkshire, UK. Um, I'm a Microsoft MVP for developer technologies, and um, most of my day-to-day -day work is involved with Umbraco, uh, which is a .NET-based open source CMS, and I am one of the Umbraco MVPs as well. Um, and um, non-work me, I have a daughter. I live with my daughter and my husband in UK. Uh, she's nine years old, currently in the Easter break, so which means that I need to ha find things to keep her busy <laughs> starting tomorrow when I'm at work. Uh, and I read a lot. I like reading. That's like my uh, winding down activity of the day. And um, I'm also a student of Carnatic music vocals. Uh, Carnatic music is an Indian, it's a stream of Indian classical music. And um, I've been training for the past five, five, six years. Um, so uh, I'm a student. <laughs> I, I have exams, which I have to in, in which I have to perform in front of a panel examiner as well as write a two-hour theory wow. paper every six months, uh, which I am awesome. uh, really fond of. Actually, it's, it's like my other passion outside code and technology. Uh, so even though I'm with Umbraco, doing a lot of work with Umbraco, I still keep in touch with the outside realm, Azure, nifty services like Azure Static Web Apps. I speak a lot about uh, APIs um, just because I like doing that. I like learning and passing on that knowledge uh, to others and then building on top of that. So here I am today. <laughs> That's great. And then how did you get into IT or specifically into Azure? Uh, Azure, Azure just happens to everyone at some point, isn't it? Because it is the cloud platform that you have to uh, follow. And there's so much happening as well. Think about everything and anything in .NET. Think about things outside .NET as well, like Python, Node.js. Uh, everything is supported in Azure. And uh, of course, it's infrastructure as service, platform as service. Uh, what, what is not to like about Azure? Um, and um, it, it is huge, like there's so many verticals and horizontals with Azure. So I think the key is to find out services that you'd like to follow and keep following those services, which is what I do, uh, because yeah, it, it is impossible to keep up with everything. So I follow certain, uh, certain services like this uh, and then keep try to keep up to date with them, which is what I do. Awesome, that's great. So with that being said, we'll let you uh, get started with your presentation. Yeah, sure, thank you. No worries. Um, so, okay. Hello everyone, once again. Um, today we'll be talking about configuration in Azure Static Web Apps. Um, so when I looked at Azure Static Web Apps, uh, that was two years ago, 
uh, when it became generally available. And just as I said, this is one service that I have been following ever since then. The minute I started using Azure Static Web App for one of my hobby projects, I took an instant liking to it. And I thought it's nifty and smart. And over the course of last two years, I've seen it um, build and become very rich in feature set. So today, we will focus uh, around the configuration of Azure Static Web Apps because with something like Azure Static Web Apps, configuration is made to look really, really simple. But there's lots of things going on underneath the hood, which is taken away from you. So we will discuss all those points of configuration today. And uh, we will also see what more is pos possible with the configuration. What are the extension points as well? I'm going to skip this slide because you already had an introduction about me from Chris and Abdul. Uh, but here I am, Purnima Naya, speaking to you from Berkshire, UK. So why do we have Azure Static Web Apps in first place? If you look at modern web development that is happening these days, you can see there's an increasing, there's an increasingly adopting, uh, they are increasingly adopting a pattern of having a JavaScript powered front end with something like Angular or Vue or React, and then um, it connecting to an API for all the data and content. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we have static site generators. We also have uh, modern, powerful web browsers, which makes it possible to run .NET and C Sharp on the browser using technologies like Blazor. So all this is happening with web development these days. Now think of an MVC web application. It is a strong pattern. It is not going to go anywhere, but if you, if you just Think about it for a moment. You can see that the MVC application is actually doing the purpose of being that API, which does all the backend heavy lifting, and also uh, acts as a web server, which then uh, rent, which serves up your HTML, which serves up your imagery, all the static content. Now, what if we have some kind of a service where this responsibility is split up into two different components? And what if we say we can deploy that to cloud, make it scalable, globally available? That is Azure Static Web App for you. So with Azure Static Web App, I define it as a turnkey service for developing and deploying modern full stack app. We will come back to it in greater detail, but just understand this for now, that turnkey service means it can be provisioned for immediate use. We will see more about this later, but just bear this in mind. With Azure Static Web Apps, you can build static front ends with an optional serverless API. What you have with your Azure Static Web Apps is static assets, like your HTML, maybe your pre-built, pre-rendered HTML, uh, your front-end templates, uh, you will have your imagery, all the JavaScript, and you have a serverless API. Uh, in the most basic form, it is an Azure function, and it is completely optional. But both these components together make up the Azure Static Web App. So it is a single package which is composed of your static assets plus your serverless API. That is Azure Static Web Apps. So as you can see, your app is, uh, is to serve the static content, but through globally distributed locations. So you have your CDN in place for you, plus your serverless API endpoints using Azure Functions, again, which can be scaled on demand. So you have your static content made available through a CDN, which means that it is optimized for content delivery, plus your Azure Functions, which can be scaled on demand, which means that is also optimized which means your users get maximum performance and the best experience through your Azure Static Web Apps. And when I think about Azure Static Web Apps, um, it, can be, it can be an ideal candidate for hosting apps and apps which are built with libraries like Blazor, Angular, Vue, React, static site generators, not limited to the list that you see here, uh, but even beyond, but anything that makes use of pre-built, pre-rendered content, Azure Static Web Apps is a very, very good choice for that. In fact, uh, with Blazor WebAssembly, I don't think I want to think beyond Azure Static Web Apps because it's that brilliant. 
What are the features that we get out of the box with Azure Static Web Apps? We get first class GitHub and Azure DevOps integration. We get globally distributed static content. We get free SSL certificates. We get custom domains, uh, which we can add to our um, resource. We, we have managed authentication provider integrations. We have customizable authorization role definitions. We can have routing rules in place, and we have integrated API support. Not only that, Azure Static Web App is seen as a complete solution starting from local development all the way to hosting. And out of the box, it understands what is needed to build and deploy most of the familiar frameworks and libraries and static gen site generators. If you go into the documentation of Azure Static Web Apps, it gives you a list of what is supported out of the box, what the platform understands out of the box so that you can build and deploy that for you. So this actually means that developers can stop worrying about the DevOps aspect, that is how to deploy it, but they can focus on the code that, and development work. And to help with that, there's a workflow which is tailored to your de developer's daily workflow. So you follow what your developer follows what they have been following as a practice. And that is used to deploy your app all the way from your local development environment, all the way up to your resource. So what does this workflow mean? You have your code uh, as a repo in GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket or even Azure DevOps, but the full integration is possible with GitHub Actions and Azure DevOps pipelines. When you make a, a code change, uh, say to the main branch, um, any of these CI CD uh, workflows would be watching that branch of your choice. In my case, I'm saying that, hey, GitHub Actions, watch any changes to the main branch for me. And when, whenever there is a push happening to the main branch or when there's a pull request closed against the main branch, merged and closed, uh, the actions kick in because it's watching the main branch and it spins up and deploys to your Azure uh, static web apps uh, resource. And both the static part as well as the API part is deployed in one go. So if this is something that you're not keen on having both the static part as well as the API deploying in one go, there are ways around it. Um, but just hold this thought for now because we are, uh, we are discussing what is happening in the most basic pattern. So this is the basic Azure Static Web App um, workflow, which is very similar to any developer's daily workflow, which is followed as like a practice. So with that, let us have a quick demo. So what I have here is a solution with a Blazor app as well as an API. So all my demos today are Blazor based because I'm a .NET developer, I'm more comfortable with Blazor. Uh, I have used a, a .NET 7 isolated worker process function here and I have used the uh, Visual Studio out of the box Blazor WebAssembly template, but in the fetch data page where it fetches the weather forecast information, instead of using the JSON file that is used in the Visual Studio template, I am making my web, that Blazor component reach out to my API for information. And what happens is in my API, which is a .NET 7 function, I have the route displayed like so, where the forecast slash uh, the number of days. And depending upon the number of days, I am forming uh, a list of weather forecast object, which has a date, a temperature, which is generated randomly, and a summary uh, based on the temperature. It's a basic switch statement. And my fetch data page in the Blazor app reaches out to this API for 10 days worth of information, uh, gets and deserializes that JSON and then loops through and displays the weather information on the page. I'm not gonna run this locally, but I'm gonna set up a resource um, on Azure to build and deploy this. I have already got all of this in a GitHub repo. So what I'll do is I'll go create a Azure static web app That is here. Let's create it. And then 
I'm going to choose my resource group and subscription. Let us say, come cloud with us demo one. So that is the name of my resource. I'm choosing a free plan, which gives me all of the features that I spoke to you about. I'm going to host it in West Europe. And then it's going to ask me where my um, source code is. So I'm going to choose GitHub because my source is on GitHub. I'm going to choose my repository, which is come cloud with us demo one. And um, I'm going to choose the main branch. So this is the branch my GitHub actions will be watching. And I need to choose a build preset. This is the framework or the gen static set generator that I'm using. It understands a lot of things. As you can see here, I'm choosing Blazor. Now it asks me where the app location is. So the app location is the folder where my front end app resides, which is the simple weather forecast app. Let me go and input that. And in my function, we have this. So the API location is the folder where my code for the API is, which is here. And the output location is where the front end assets build to and put all, everything in. This is a Blazor app and www root with the index.html and all the static assets and imageries what the output location is. It might be dist for Angular, for example. So that is the output location. I'm going to review and create it. So this is now creating a resource for us. So this, I'm doing it via the portal, but you can uh, create a resource via ARM template, BICEP, um, Azure CLI, all of that. That is all by all means possible. If I go to my resource, uh, this is the name of my static web app resource but the url it's kind of really funny it is like two random words followed by an alphanumeric pattern now if i visit this url it is actually deploying the content for me now if i go back to my github repo which is here what you can see is that it has added that workflow file into my repo so the minute the resource is created and tied up it adds this um it's this workflow file into my repo for me. And it should also be running because the workflow file is added to the main branch committed and pushed in. The workflow is actually watching the main branch. So it starts a deploy straight away. While that is getting deployed, let us have a look at the workflow file, which is the first configuration for the day, which is our build configuration. So um, as you can see, it is watching the main branch for any pushes and any pull requests, which are open, synchronized, reopened, or closed. And there are two jobs. There is the build and deploy, and there's the close pull request as well. So with the build and deploy, this runs if the uh, event that is happening is a push or a pull request as long as it's not closed. And uh, we can go through the most important things here. The first thing is the action that it uses. This is the action that it uses, and it uses Microsoft Oryx underneath the hood. There are three different inputs which are absolutely mandatory, without which uh, you cannot have uh, integration between GitHub and Azure Static Web Apps. The first one is this Web Apps API token. This is what ties up to your repo, to your resource. So it is using this token that it knows which resource to deploy to. You can reset this token if you want, but you cannot get rid of this. Without this, it won't work. The next thing is the repo token. This is for GitHub integration. We will talk about this in a minute. The third um, must have input is the app location, where is uh, the, the, the folder which contains your front end source code. We also have an API location as well as the output location, which is what we actually put in while creating the resource. But if we go and have a look at this action here, uh, the static web apps deploy, there are a lot of other inputs it can take as well. So there are a few which I want to discuss today. The first one is the API build command and the app build command. So we, uh, we saw about how the static web apps has an understanding of a number of various frameworks and sta uh, static site generators. Now, if your framework that you're using is not something that the platform understands, then you can take control of the build process using the app 
a build command using which you can say, this is the commands used to build my app, and this is the commands used to build my API. So take complete control over that build process. And if you are using that, you might also want to use the skip app build and the skip API build, uh, which gives it a, um, uh, which specifies that do not use the default build process and the artifact from the build, but take my build command and skip your app build and API build. In such cases, you want to turn this to true. By default, it is false. So that is uh, some of the inputs that is worth having a look. And what it gives us is the web app URL of the static, uh, the URL of the static web app. So let's go and see whether our action has finished. It's still running by the looks of it. It is still is. So that is um, Azure Static Web Apps in action. Let us come back to this while uh, once it has finished running, but let's move on with our slides for now. What Azure Static Web Apps also gives you is pull request environments and named environments. So um, what you can also have is you can have a pull request raised against the main branch, which is being watched. And whenever you have such a pull request, what happens is um, some integration kicks in and then it automatically deploys an environment to your static web app for you. And that environment is an environment where you can preview your changes. And it is very useful for your hobby projects or personal projects, which are not very uh, business critical. But if you have a business critical application where you want proper preview environments, you might want to look at named environments, which is again possible. Like you can have a developer branch deploying to a development environment, staging branch deploying to a staging environment, and so on. Again, that can be configured from the Azure static web app file. And there are input parameters for it. You can spe specify your production branch. Say the production can be, uh, branch can be termed as main. So only when it is main will the production uh, run actually kick in. Uh, any other branches, deployment from any other branches will be considered preview environments, as it says here. And if you want to suggest the deployment environment, you can do that here as well. So if you want to deploy to the dev environment or staging environment, you can have this input marked as well. So if you are really good at GitHub Actions and you know it inside out, you can have a single action file doing all of this for you. And you can take this further as well because you can have multi-stage deployments, you can have named environments, you can have approvals, you can have your playwright um, playwright um, uh, tests run as well alongside deployments, all that is possible. Uh, now, let us go back and see whether it is finished running. Yeah, that's finished running. So if I go and have a look at here, that should be my simple weather forecast app. Hopefully it picks up something from the API. No, it hasn't. The reason being, did I mess something up? Yes, I did mess something up. Uh, we will come back to fixing that. Uh, yeah, I can show you that here, actually. In fact, let us actually fix the broken stuff. So the broken stuff is here. It is expecting an environment variable, which is what is causing it uh, to fail. So let me actually fix that. Let me create a branch here. Uh, feature slash fixes. Uh, Commit, push. So that is a branch pushed in. And if I go back into my repo, create a pull. Uh, before creating a pull request, we need one more thing. So the GitHub uh, Git repo token, it needs read and write permissions, as I've given here. With the read and write permissions here, what it does is when it spins up the uh, preview environment for pull requests, it also uh, um, it also uh, gives you a comment back in your pull request with the link of the new pull request environment in place. So if I go in and create a pull request, that is 
the pull request. Now this should be doing some work behind the scene. It should deploy, hopefully. Where has it reached? It is built. Okay, let's move on with the slides and come back to it before the next demo. Uh, we have a couple of hosting plans with Azure Static Web Apps. The first one is the free plan, which I have been using, which is, uh, which is well and good enough for personal and hobby projects. And all the features that I spoke to you about, including the GitHub, um, GitHub workflow that is available for you with the free plan. And there's also a standard or the production plan, which is good for the production apps. And there are differences between the two. Uh, the first one being bigger app size. With a production plan, you have 500 MB of just the app size, whereas it is 250 with the free plan. You get more staging environments. So you can have up to 10 concurrent pull request environments with the production plan. So you can have 10 different features being previewed and tested. While as with your um, with your stay free plan, you can have only three at any point of time. You have the ability to bring in your own API with um, with the production plan, and you have custom authentication providers as well. So let us now talk about API support, uh, which is one point where um, where the apps, where the different kind of hosting plans really really differ. First of all, APIs are optional with Azure Static Web Apps. It's not necessary that every static web app has an API, but there are two configurations of API, which is the managed and bring your own. So far, we have been seeing the managed. Uh, I don't have a demo of bring your own today, but I will tell you what the differences are. Uh, regardless of whether it's managed or bring your own, the API route is prefixed to slash API, which is the reason uh, why in my demo for the day, even though the route to my Azure functions is weather forecast slash the number of days, the route parameter, in the actual fetching code, I have an API prefix to it. So this API is the prefix required and it is non-negotiable. And the API is always served from the same origin as the app, which means course is not an issue at all. Um, at any point of time, a SWA environment, that is a static web app environment, can be connected only to one type of backend API, and only HTTP requests are permitted. And when we speak about the two different configurations of API, the managed and bring your own, the first difference is that with managed API, Azure functions only are allowed, while as with bring your own, Azure app service, Azure functions, container apps, Azure API management, all are options but your static web app can connect to only one of these at any point of time. With the managed API, the API is deployed with the app, whereas with bring your own, uh, you deploy and manage the APIs yourself. So if you want to segregate that deployment, which I said earlier, have the static, uh, static web app, the front end aspect of it deployed at a different time uh, or completely separately to your API deployment, that's possible with bring your own. Uh, with managed API, you have pull request environments and that works seamlessly with the pull request environment, but with bring your own, that is not possible. Uh, you will have to resort to different static web apps itself to preview your changes, uh, bring in your own APIs, et cetera. Now let us go back and see whether our run has completed. So it has completed. So fingers crossed, it should give me a comment, which I can already see is here. So it, ha it has given me where the, uh, the pull request environment is. Now, if I go into my resource and have a look at environments, that is the environment corresponding to my pull request. Now, if I go and have a look at it, it should load with the API data, fingers crossed. There we go. So this information is coming in from the API. Now, if I go and inspect the network here, this is the API call. And as you can see, it is loading from the same origin. So of course, it's not an issue. Now, if we want to merge this pull request, confirm the merge, what happens is, there is another 
job in the workflow that kicks in. That is the close pull request job. What this job does is it goes and cleans that pull request environment for you. So there is maintaining of the pull request environment happening as well for you alongside the deployment, which is also happening because the pull request has merged into the main branch, which is watched by the GitHub workflow. So there is the cleanup as well as a deploy happening. So it should be running now. Moving on. So that is the first set of configuration for the day, which is the build configuration. You can uh, you can go to re any real end with that because that workflow file is for you to actually um, tweak and um, make it um, act according to what your business needs as a requirement. That brings us to the second topic of the day, which is app settings, which is uh, more of the API configuration. So many cases we might have the API which reaches out to a REST endpoint or even a database uh, for gathering all the content and data. Uh, in one of my hobby projects uh, where I had a Blazor WebAssembly app uh, talking, uh, uh, getting all the content from a headless CMS. So in such a case, what I did was I used the API which comes along with the uh, static web, uh, web app to actually store the secret about my headless CMS and to get that securely. So such settings can be stored uh, for the API securely with app settings. And these are then read as environment variables. These are incredibly useful because you can change configuration without any deployment. And the use cases, as I uh, said, are storing database connection strings, secrets, etc. So in my case, um, let us have a quick demo of how this can be achieved. I have my weather forecast function here. Let us say I want to add a custom header to every request, uh, every response that is given out by my API. And the name of the custom header comes in from such a setting. So which is what I commented out here today. Uh, and the value can be set to anything. Here I'm setting it in the number of days. I'm going to commit it straight to the main branch for now to make things easier. Let us see whether it's finished running. Otherwise, it's going to queue up everything. It is still running. But it should have cleaned up the environment for me. So the preview environment is gone. And it is actually doing a deploy to the live environment, which can happen any time now. Let's just wait for this. Actually, let me just continue because otherwise it's just gonna, oh, that's deployment complete. <laughs> I think that was more like a little bit of warning to my Azure Static Web App. So let me actually do a commit straight to the main in this instance. Um, let me pull because I have multiple request. Master. Which is my branch here? I mean, let me delete this. Delete main. And pull again and see. There. That's fine. Master is not fine. I'm going to make changes directly to the main. So, this is to make sure that there is this 
value called custom header name, which is read from the app settings and then added to the response of every request. So let us um, have this in place. There we go, it should be, let's, let me just add one more line. Let's add two headers actually. There we go. So adding headers. What I also need to do now is Okay, I need to pull before I push and push. Okay, we'll come back to this because this is just playing up for some strange reason. Um, Application configuration. So we'll we'll now look at the third configuration of the day, which is application configuration, which is completely managed using a file, which is staticwebapp.config.json. It's a very simple file. It's a very simple JSON file, uh, but it is extremely powerful. And it must also always be placed in the folder or subfolders of the app folder. So here in my second demo of the day, I've got a static web app config JSON, which is in my app folder. But if you do not want it in the app folder, you want it elsewhere, then you can specify that, hey, my static web app config JSON is in a different folder. And that different folder can be specified using the input location that is here. Uh, there's an input command for it, uh, which is the config file location. So with this, you can specify that this is the directory where you should be looking for your config file. So that customization is also possible. It controls a whole lot of things, including routing, fallback rules, and much more. And there is uh, an overlap with authentication and authorization in some cases as well with the routing. And one of the major aspects of this config file is the, the way you can customize routes and a variety of different ways of customizing routes are available to you. The first one starting with the redirect. So in this example, I'm redirecting slash my counter to counter. You can have re uh, rewrites. So everything under slash calendar slash will be rewritten into calendar.html. You can have um, cache per route. In this case, I'm caching images and thumbnails um, to a certain amount. You can also have global headers added to responses, which is the fourth example. You can have navigation fallback. So in case of Blazor or any framework which uses front-end uh, routing or client-side routing, um, if I just go into the app and refresh, what happens is it goes into a 404 because the app runs from the client and that routing has not been initialized yet. In case of Blazor, it is in the index.html that bootstraps the entire application. The routing starts from index.html. So whenever I have a link which I share, like for deep linking, or if I refresh the page, I want the app to fall back to index.html before it can go into the, say, the fetch data page after the refresh. So in, the, in that case, I'm specifying the navigation fallback as index.html. But also for the images and CSS, I'm excluding that navigation fallback completely. So that is also possible. If you want to secure routes, that you can again do with um, the, the routing mechanism in static web app config JSON. Uh, so in the first example, I am marking that anything with slash profile or starting with profile is allowed to only authenticated users. Now, frameworks like Blazor and Angular rely on client-side routing. So this is not possible with Blazor. Uh, Blazor relies completely on the Blazor's own kind of authorization and um, locking down mechanism authenticating uh, mechanism. But where the app is served from the static web app, it is possible to lock down URLs via this method. However, 
Even in case of Blazor, when you have an API, you can lock that down. For example, anything in, in the last case, I'm saying that anything with slash API slash, I'm locking down uh, a get request to only registered users. That is the user group that I'm, that I'm locking it down to. You can also have response overrides. You can have IP whitelisting. You can always uh, have a trailing slash by having trailing slash to always or not having trailing slash at all as well. So that is all possible. Now, when it comes to static web app config JSON, it is not really possible to test it locally. So remember I said in one of my first slides that Azure Static Web App is also complete with a local development tool and your SWA CLI tool is that bridging cap. This is your complete local development tool and it can help you with even deploy as well. Um, now the static web app config JSON acts on the swap platform itself. So all the redirects that you see, all of that acts upon the platform itself. So which means if you want to test any of that changes locally, you cannot do it by just running your application. You need to rely on the SWA CLI tool for that. So this is your complete local development tool and it emulates the static web app platform for you locally. And it serves the app, the API, and uh, there is a proxy which routes the request, the corresponding part of the emulator. This, is, this needs Node.js to run and it can be installed from this repo. There's an uh, NPM command it gives you to install this uh, CLI tool locally. And at the heart of the CLI tool is a reverse proxy, which listens on port 4280, which is the default port. And what it looks for is the request that comes in. And anything with the request with slash API in the request path, that is routed to the functions runtime. Anything with slash auth, dot auth that is given to the authentication and emulator part of this was uh, the SWA platform and everything else is given to the static content server because all the APIs come on slash API all your authentication requests comes in with slash dot auth and everything rest goes to the st static content server so to have a look at this no, before we have a look at this, we will also talk about security model because in my next uh, demo, I've got a little bit of authentication and authorization going on as well. So with our out of the box uh, static web apps, you get access to a series of pre-configured providers like Azure AD, GitHub and Twitter. Um, and there's also Facebook and Google, I think in preview. With static web apps that is in the free tier or the free hosting tier, you can create custom roles, but you cannot have a custom registration because you have to invite users, uh, users to join those different roles. But with the production hosting plan, you can have custom authentication in place. And once logged in, users be belong to the authenticated or anonymous roles by default. Um, and furthermore, in any request or any author authorization related APIs, always have this route prefix that is slash dot auth. And there is a client principal data object which stores the information of the current user. And if you want to get information of the uh, current logged in user, you can use a get request to slash dot auth slash me. And in addition to the app itself, you can have the same client principal object information made available in your APIs as well. For that, the SWA platform itself adds a header to every API call that it makes. And that header is called XMS client principle. And that can be used in your API function to get the client principle data. This is in fact a base 64 encoded version of your client principle data object that is available on the app. And uh, it's added by the SWA platform itself. So you don't need to worry about the security aspect of it. So before we move on, uh, before we move on, let's have a look at this um, demo that I've set up here. So for this, I have another demo, which I've already deployed, which is here. So that is my URL. It's already giving me something to say login. 
So the way the login and um, user registration and invitation works is like so. I go into the role management. I invite a user. I am using GitHub. I know that I'm using GitHub, so it's easy for me. So I'm going to invite myself, Nima Nair, and I'm adding myself into the role of ad admin. And it generates an invite link for me. Now, if I go into the invite link, it, it takes me to the GitHub login user process, and it gives it, it, it takes the consent to get my user information from GitHub, and then it shows that I'm logged in as Purnima Nair. Now, as you can see, there are two more links available to me, which is the fetch data and logout. If I go into fetch data, it should get me some information from the API. So the idea is I have locked down the API as well as the fetch data page. And if I log out, it's complete logout. I even if I go to fetch data, which is here, it won't work at all. It's completely locked down. So let us see how we have uh, achieved this. So first of all, uh, in my static web app config JSON, I have locked down the API route completely to admin. So which means that in my API, I can check for the presence of the header, decrypt it, and then if there is no header found, I can just send a bad request back in. Um, then, now it is all Blazor authentication provider kicking into action. I'm not going to explain too much of it, but to give you an idea, I start with creating an authentication state provider for static web apps. This is my own class. Um, I think there's a good package as well by Anthony Chu, which does the same thing. It inherits from the authentication state provider. And because my authentication data is available in the slash dot auth slash me path, I make an HTTP call to it and get the data as JSON. And from there, I form the client principle. Again, all Blazor concepts. And in my Blazor app, I start off with the app.razor, which is where my routing is. So I add this cascading authentication state, which helps me get the authentication state across my entire app as a cascading parameter. With that in place, I can now go to the fetch data page and then add the authorized attribute in place. This completely locks down the page to unauthenticated users. And in my nav menu, again, because I've got that authentication state cascading across my entire app, I can have some data in place, some code in place to say that only if I'm authorized, show the fetch data page and the low code page. So this protects from people actually seeing the link. And this um, attribute here actually protects the uh, people uh, protects the page against someone reaching the page and then reading that data. And in my index.razor, if you remember, I had that login link. And uh, it is actually pointing to a friendly URL called slash login. Because um, there in the static web app config JSON, I have a redirect which says slash login actually redirects to slash dot auth slash login slash GitHub. Because every login URL regardless of the provider, it follows the URL pattern slash dot auth slash login slash the provider name, which is GitHub or Twitter or Azure AD. Similarly, the logout URL is like absolutely uh, uniform slash dot auth slash logout regardless of the provider. So that is the two URLs that I use for my login and logout. And that is what you saw in action on this site. Now, if I go to login again, I am logged in, and if I go to slash dot auth slash me, this is the client principal information, which has a user ID and the user details. This user ID is unique for this static web app for me. And if I use the same GitHub credentials in another static web app, it will be a unique ID that I get there. So the user ID is unique to per user per static web app. Um, 
And in this case, if I'm going to save anything to the database, it'll be against my user details. If you want to create a profile page, you can do that by having a post login redirect page. You can have a post logout redirect page. If you are having a production app, you can even have a signing of the roles programmatically as well. All the registration, assigning roles programmatically, you can have a custom workflow with it. So that is about the client principle. And we saw a login in action. Uh, however, you didn't see a static uh, web app CLI in action, which I can show you now. So to have this uh, static web app CLI um, in action, let us start the developer command. And here, I've got some stuff copied over. So the command I have is swa start, and I'm saying start this local host path for me, which is nothing but the path that I see here in my loan settings dot JSON, which is 5368, not 5268. Uh, that'll do for now. And I'm using the hyphen hyphen run dot net watch run. So this is the custom run command I'm using for a blazer and then i am saying that my app location is this and my api location is this and if i start running this why is it not running let's try this again Tools, command line, developer prompt. Oh dear, oh dear. There we go. That's the static web app CLI running. It's doing all the build for you. It, it starts running your Azure Static Web App um, API as well as the app for you. And finally, it should say the 4280 port should be ready for me. So if I go open up a new in private window, I should see the app in action. I think I used the wrong port here, which is the reason this is, no, it is because it is using HTTPS. I was practicing my demos and the HTTPS has been cached. I am using the non-secure version, but you can have a hyphen S option into that SWA start CLI command if you want to run it in the secure port. So that is my API. I won't show you much, but I have a happy page here, which says this page is really happy. And this is the URL, but we can test the redirect to it, which I have already set up here. So I'm saying that slash happy redirects to happy page here. So if we copy happy and then put it in here, redirects to happy page. So that is testing um, redirects locally using SWA CLI. So that is the second, uh, sorry, the third configuration of the day. And if we go back to the first demo where it was still running and make it, try and see whether I can run it. Can I push it now? Just delete master here. Okay, it's still not pushing. I messed up somewhere, but that's fine. Let's move on. The last configuration that I'm going to discuss for the day is Data API Builder. So Data API Builder is actually a tool in Preview, which can be really helpful to expose database objects as a REST or GraphQL endpoint. So you have your Azure SQL database or a Cosmos DB or a PostgreSQL. You have tables in it, and you want to expose uh, tables or views or even stored procedures as REST or GraphQL endpoints you can make use of Data API Builder. It is an open source tool. Uh, 
and it can be deployed onto Azure as an Azure Container app, or you can deploy it in the Azure App Service. But with static web apps, you can make use of full integration with Data API Builder on Azure as a managed service using the database connections feature. And the API that is developed using the Data, data API Builder is prefixed with slash data API. And again, you can use your SWA CLI tool to test your database connections. Furthermore, you can have your static web apps as the authentication provider. So if you have authentication on your apps, you can carry that forward to the API that is built by Data API Builder. And then you can have permissions on your various different tables or database objects as well. And there's support for role-based authorization. So if, you, if you're saying that, hey, the weather forecast information is available only to, say, admin users, I can make sure that the Data API for weather forecast information, say for reading weather forecast information from a database table is again locked down to admin because the authentication and that authorization data flows seamlessly into data API builder as well. And this is configured using a config called the static web app database config JSON, which should be at the root of the repository. So unlike the ap application configuration, which should be at the root of your static web app uh, rep uh, static web app location this should be at the root of the repository itself this is one place i went wrong however like the other configuration you can actually uh, specify a separate directory for this as well using the input data api location so the way you start off with um with a data api builder is you start off with creating a um, a config file like so. So you use the SWA CLI tool with the DB init command, specifying the type of the database that you're trying to connect to, in which case it's MS SQL. So this creates a config file for me in a folder called SWA DB connections. And if I open it up, it has different things which will help me uh, kind of configure where my database is, you can configure your entities, etc. So this is the initial, conf uh, initial config file that it sets up. Now, in my case, I've got a database which I have set up here with a little table called weather forecast, which is here. And I'm trying to build a data, build an API using data API builder, which reads information from the weather forecast table. So it's the same data that I'm kind of reusing. So I think I have like four rows of data here. Let us see how we can expose this data as an endpoint. In my third uh, demo for the day, I have a copy of, oh, that is not good at all. Don't worry, I will actually, oh, let me open this up. So what happened is I had the connection string details in, <laughs> in, um, black and white over there. So let me, let me just go and take that away for, for a minute. Saved. So this is what my connections, where my connection string would have been. Don't worry, I'll just take it out after the session is done with. Now about the API configuration. So it is asking for whether REST should be enabled and whether GraphQL should be enabled. So in my case, I have set both to true. You can have either or or both, as you can see. Uh, and I'm specifying the path as well. So my REST API would be at slash API and the GraphQL API would be at slash GraphQL. We are not dealing with GraphQL today. I'm just going to go with REST for the day. Uh, and regarding the host, the mode is, is production and I am allowing my test, um, the SWA CLI as one, as the, one of the allowed origin for cores. The authentication provider is static web apps. And in the entities, I can start configuring my entities, which is my database objects. In this case, it's my weather forecast table. So I've got the entity name here, the weather forecast. Mind you, the entity name is case sensitive. So I have to use the same exact one in my API. 
I'm saying the source for my entity is this table that you see here. And in permissions, I'm saying that all actions are allowed on all uh, or on the anonymous roles. But if you want to lock it down, say reading the information from the table to be for admin only, I would have the role to be admin and the actions to be uh, everything. So you, you can lock down, read, or just write to a particular database object by the user role. This is pretty open, but I can again run this locally and test it using my SWA CLI. But before that, let us uh, go have a look at the actual code. As you can see, there is no API here. I'm relying upon that data builder API for me. In the fetch data page, as you have seen before, instead of reaching out to slash API slash weather forecast, I am using slash data hyphen API, which is the prefix for my data API API builder, forward, uh, uh, for, uh, followed by the slash API, which is where my REST API exists, followed by my entity name, that is weather forecast, which is what I have specified here. So that is simple. And the output that I get, the JSON, is a single JSON object called value, which I can see uh, deserialize and then convert it in by forecast. And then it is business as usual, loop through and display the details. So that is um, data API builder, a little sneak peek into it. Let us kill this before I start running other SWA CLI. That's done. That's done. So now let us open up another command prompt here for this project. And I've got some code here again. So again, I'm saying start my local development server with .NET Watch Run as the command. And that is my app folder. But use the data API location as SWAR DB connections where my static web app database config is and use that database connection to build and run this app. So with that, if we run this and see, again, it's the same bug as before, the HTTPS. Uh, if I now open up a new in private window, and go to HTTP localhost. There you go. That is Weather Forecast Data API Builder. It is loading from the app for me. And moment of truth, if you go to fetch data, it should have that information coming in from the database table. Now, this is the same information that is coming in from my database table. So there we go. We have our Azure Static Web App talking to the database connections. This is a feature still in preview, uh, but do have a play around with this feature. Uh, I found it incredibly useful. I want to play around with the GraphQL aspect of it as well and see where it takes me. So that is all about Azure Static Web App and a sneak peek into the configuration, uh, the points of configuration and extensions as well. You can actually build on top of it. You can actually have custom authentication providers in place. You can have a function to assign roles programmatically. You can, uh, you can build on top of this. So I hope I have given you enough information to get going and build on top of this information and plan your uh, hobby projects or even production apps with Azure Static Web Apps. And that is all the resources for the day. I will copy and send this across to uh, Chris and Abdul as well. Awesome. Awesome job. Awesome, awesome, awesome. <laughs> So I, I, if you don't mind, I, I do have one question. I thought this was mm -hmm. fantastic. And um, <clears throat> one of the things that I know, uh, you know, with, we talked about at, um, static web apps here, but even with Azure um, app service, there are, and you dipped a little bit into free certificates and use of free mm -hmm. certificates. Um, could you talk a little bit more um, about like how those are utilized with static web apps and custom domains and, and so on and so forth, if you don't mind. 
Yeah, sure. So as you as you might have seen from the portal, all my apps which were actually running on Azure already mm -hmm. had an HTTPS to it. So this is free, of course, it's given to you. So for a uh, for a hobby project, this would be mm -hmm. really, really good. And I have given URLs out like this to people as well. Mine was called Witty Mushroom, which an S <laughs> with an HTTPS. <laughs> Sorry, <No problem>. Chris. <laughs> uh, but I, 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 I like it. It's, it's, uh, it's it's quite funny, but right. if you want, you can have custom domains added from here as well. Uh, but then I think with your custom domains, you'll have to bring in your own free S uh, SSL certificate. But then again, if you have Azure managing your domains for you, then tying that all up becomes easy. But if you want more documentation, let's go into Azure Static Web Apps documentation itself and see Static Web Apps. So let's go here, not learning modules. Let's go to publish your site. And uh, there was concepts or how to guides. There we go, custom domains. So here is something about the custom domains. Uh, I can post it here. I will later on add this to my list of resources as well. So there's wow. information about how to use your Azure, Azure DNS and uh, using the Apex domain as well. Um, the documentation is top notch, so read through it. Plus, there is something that I wanted to highlight as well. So let me open this up. This is one of my favorite things about Azure Static Web Apps. Um, every month, I think on the third Thursday, there's an Azure Static Web Apps community stand up where they focus mm -hmm. on one topic about Azure Static Web Apps. Um, for example, last month, it was all about uh, the data API builder uh, because that was that was around when it was released. But in here, you would have lots and lots of information about this. And if you attend one of the community standards, you can talk to the team and then get answers from them as well. I, I try to at least catch a offline kind of rewatch version of it if I can. There's incredible amount of information in here as well, like best practices, all of that. So um, definitely want to bookmark. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I did have one I'm other... sorry I messed up my Git repo with the main pool. It, it just never works real time, oh, does no. it? <laughs> Well, I, I always joke, uh, if you've watched other sessions too, as we have other folks who come into this, I always, I always refer to something called uh, speed of cloud. And, you know, it seems like every time it's like you go to deploy something, it works and it works and it works until you go to demo it live. And then it decides <laughs> to not work a little bit, but that's okay. You yeah. got through it. Um, it's fantastic. I've practiced this like countless times. <laughs> but again, it's something simple that catches right. you on the day and time. But right. the point that I wanted to make is that if you have um, a setting, say, in the APIs, um, no, sorry, in the configuration, what you can have is like an application setting. So if and when it loads, you can add an application setting like test and a test value and save it. This is encrypted upon REST. And you can read the value of this variable as an environment variable, which is what I was trying, trying to show using my demo here. So I would set up this custom header name as my variable like so with a custom header value. So what I would be reading actually is this value using this name, it's like key value pairs. So that's something that is useful for the APIs, but that's what I wanted to show. But I think people will get the point here. <laughs> yeah. But it was amazing. You were troubleshooting live. So that's actually pretty good, right? Like that's one of the things that people are amazed about. Um, I know people, other people have done that, but yeah, this was phenomenal. You were troubleshooting live and that's actually makes it much more interesting as a learning uh, curve. It, it, is even, it is even more nerve wracking when you have it <laughs> in front of a live audience as well. Oh my God. <laughs> Today I was pretty sure for some strange reason that, that something is going to go wrong, but it's fine. 
I've saved the day. I've I've gone through most of the demos that I wanted to show today. I hope people understands and gets a gist of what I'm trying to do here. Uh, because Azure Static Web Apps, as I usually say, is a speaker's heaven. You take each and every topic in Azure Static Web App, that is a topic for one hour sessions. Uh, SWA CLI, you can talk one hour with it. Even the application configuration, I've just grazed through the surface with right. enough kind of extension points mentioned. Uh, you can actually build a HTML only app demo and then show the, the routes being locked down, IP, networking, all of that. It is immensely huge. But it is it is a it is a service that I really like because of the feature set. For example, uh, if I have a production app, I can bring in Azure API management or Azure Container Services or Azure App Services. Uh, in which case you would have something called a link here instead of the managed. So you, the fact that Azure Static Web Apps connects to most of the other um, Azure services, that is amazing. And that's something that I've seen over the past two years. Again, the database, uh, the data API builder, I think that is really strong point as well because you are getting the platform to generate and host an API for you. The security is something that I can manage just through static web apps. Incredibly powerful model, which is equally fun as well, which is the reason why I wanted to kind of introduce it today. I guess that opens the door for you to come come back and do more sessions. <laughs> <laughs> it, it needs a lot more research. <laughs> You caught me there, uh, but uh, this, I have done only the managed aspect version of it where it is all managed and hosted for you. There's a whole host of other things around uh, because it's open source. You can have it as an on-premise thing that's running and connecting your Azure SQL database, or mm -hmm. you can actually deploy that to a container app or Azure app service, uh, all of that, and then connect. Azure web app to it as well. So there's lots of things going on. That makes sense. That makes sense. But with that being said, you know, um, really want to thank you for doing um, this session. This was an amazing, amazing session, really. Thank and you, thank you. Uh, again, thanks for uh, taking time out of your busy weekend. I, I know weekends are for personal time, but thank you so much for uh, getting this recorded. Um, hopefully the um, audience find this helpful and um, hope to see you again in, in our uh, come cloud with that show. <laughs> Thank you for having me as a speaker again. Uh, I I love speaking about Azure Static Web App. So it was an afternoon very well spent as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Sounds good. So thanks, everybody. We'll uh, uh, see you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.